Hi everyone, I'm Remington Nevin. I can find my presentation will get started. Okay, um, so I'm going to present to you uh, a study that I actually have underway that I started back in my uh, Army days with some funding I received from uh, uh, U.S. Army uh, Medical Research and Material Command. And it's, it's, a, it's a pharmacogenetic study into this syndrome, mefloquine intoxication syndrome. Uh, for background, this is a drug that the Army developed back in the 60s and 70s, and, and for many years we've given it to our soldiers as prophylaxis against the malaria when they travel overseas. It ends up that this drug um, carries with it a risk of a very severe intoxication reaction. It's idiosyncratic, so not everyone suffers this. But when people do, the effects are rather extreme, as we'll see. Uh, this was a subject of a lot of news stories, you may remember, uh, about a decade ago. Uh, people suffering from intoxication from, from mefloquine uh, are at risk of suicide and acts of violence, and the syndrome exhibits a phenotype that, that's almost indistinguishable from what you see in limbic uh, encephalitis, and it looks a lot like PCP and ketamine toxicity. It's actually very frightening when you see it in person. Uh, recently, the CDC published uh, a chapter in their travel medicine guide saying that this disorder or these symptoms could confound the diagnosis and management of post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, which makes it a particular concern in the military where these conditions are, are prevalent and are often diagnosed. Now, there's evidence that this is genetically mediated. It's idiosyncratic, and so you might think of a genetic uh, predisposition. And there's some evidence linking it to a specific uh, candidate gene. So this particular candidate gene is what's is what sparked our interest in doing this pharmacogenetic study. So the, the drug is a quinoline. It's very lipid soluble. So it tends to cross the blood-brain barrier and accumulate in the central nervous system where it has toxic effects. In a rat model, it actually causes neurotoxicity of the brainstem. And we think the same neurotoxicity extends up into the limbic system, to the hippocampus and the amygdala, which is the seat of emotional learning and, and fear memory. And if, if you study the pharmacokinetics in serum and in brain, you see evidence of a saturable uh, brain efflux. The concentrations in brain start off low, and then they rise over time relative to serum, which is indicative of some kind of saturable efflux. And so the thinking is, if that efflux pump responsible for transporting the drug out of the brain is, for whatever reason, dysfunctional, or has less than optimal function or might not be able to be upregulated as quickly in the presence of this drug, then this might lead to an increased risk of concentration of the drug in the brain and hence dose-dependent uh, neurotoxicity. So although there's no strong family evidence of this syndrome, because how often do families all take this drug, there's indirect evidence of, of this being genetically mediated as well. We, we know that the plasmodium parasite itself, the malaria parasite itself, develops resistance to this drug through mutations or copy number variations in a homologous gene in plasmodium falciparum MDR. So instead of not pumping it out of the food vacuole fast enough, it pumps it out more quickly and that results in methylene resistance. So that's evidence one. The second is that a, a similar mutation, MDR delta, in dogs, in some breed of dogs, specifically border collies, predisposes them to potentially fatal ivermectin toxicity. So that's some soft evidence of a genetic effect as well. And then lastly, there have been studies. There was one uh, small-scale pharmacogenetic study looking at particular polymorphisms in ABC1 and linking those to an increased risk of, of human side effects. So in a sense, what we want to do here is we want to replicate, using slightly different methodology, the findings of this, this Dutch paper. So how are we going to do this? Well, in, in the military, just so happens we have all this data and all this serum that permits us to do retrospective, de-identified, IRB-exempt uh, studies. So we, we can do a nested case control study in this uh, population. We can use, as subjects, only those who have documented prescriptions uh, for methylene and who have deployed are likely to have used it. And so what we can do is we can take cases for a particular phenotype, and we can match those in density sampling on age, gender, many other factors, and match them two, three to one. We chose two to one for this particular case. And because uh, the U.S. military conducts annual HIV surveillance and stores the serum away in this big bank, we can go into the serum bank, grab serum, and with luck, actually obtain genetic uh, material from those specimens. It ends up uh, a, a colleague of mine was able to find nanogram quantities of amplifiable DNA in, in almost every one of these specimens that she tested. 
So those specimens are de-identified, but they're linked to the data we can get from the, the database, which is really nice because the de-identified IRB exempt study and it can be done quickly. You can do these studies in a matter of weeks if you have the money. Uh, so we sent these specimens off to a commercial lab and genotyped the three SNPs that are generally studied in studies of ABCB1. And for you know, a pretty modest price, a quarter million dollars, you can do a pretty large and well-powered study. Now, knowing what I know now, after the benefits of, of taking this course, it's obvious that the three SNPs we chose are not at all optimal to cover the variation in, in ABCB1. I, I ran uh, some numbers on the Hapleview and if you, if you only had three SNPs, and we could only genotype three SNPs because of financial considerations and the fact that this is not a whole lot of genetic material in these specimens. If we, if we had wanted to choose three optimal SNPs, we would have chosen these ones and, and gotten 26% uh, coverage. But instead we chose the three SNPs that are the subject of, of many other uh, reports. And that, that only has 10% coverage of the ABCD1 uh, gene. But the, the reasons we did this are as follows. We wanted to try to replicate earlier findings. And the SNPs are in, in strong LD with each other, and there's some evidence in the literature of, of a causal effect, or at least LD, to a causal portion of the genes. But so are these SNPs themselves functional? I mean, do they, like... They're not. They're synonymous. They're synonymous. Okay. But, but the well, thinking is that, they, that they're in LD with, with an upstream like region, maybe in the promoter. Mm -hmm. And that would make sense with what we see in, in, in the phenotype, which, which, which is consistent with failed upregulation. So I, I think it, it's not ideal, but I, I think we might be able to get it at something. So we have some initial results, and I'm glad I took uh, this, this series because I, I realized that some of our earlier methodology was inappropriate. Um, quality control is pretty good for a commercial lab, considering the small amount of genetic material that we have. There's one SNP that's out of um, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, but there's, there's more than two alleles that, that we genotype, so it's a little more difficult than what we can do in haplogroup. There's no simple genotypic association with, with the PTSD phenotype. We're taking cases that were diagnosed as PTSD, and we're saying some of these PTSD cases aren't actually PTSD. They're mefloquine intoxication. That's the closest match to a phenotype that we can come up with. But what we find is there is this evidence of, of haplotype association with PTSD. And, and I didn't show it here, but there's some evidence that the, the softer the PTSD diagnosis is, so the less precise that diagnosis is the, the stronger the correlation. So that, that to me, I think, is, is interesting. But what, what I find interesting is there's no association with the triple T haplotype that was found to be associated with neuropsychiatric symptoms in this Dutch uh, phenotype. So, so whether there's different patterns of LD, this is a, a homogeneous Dutch population in the first study, and this is a mixed Caucasian okay. population in the second study, I don't know. It's, it, it's interesting, and I think even adjusting for the multiple testing that we're doing, I think the p-value is still significant here. So I think with this, we have enough uh, evidence to support a, a future study. And even with the data set that we have, I intend to, to phase the, the data and, and conduct more robust analyses using uh, logistic regression and so on. And then uh, further to what I was saying, really stratify the phenotypes and dig into some of the medical data that we have um, in our files. And then if, if, if we get the money, Consider repeating this with, a, with an improved phenotype. We now know how this intoxication syndrome presents. It presents with dizziness and some symptoms of vestibular ocular dysfunction together with anxiety and some other symptoms consistent with PTSD. So looking in administrative databases for evidence of vestibulopathy or visual disturbance together with PTSD would be more precise and more closely match the phenotype of methylene intoxication. So in your cases, we're both exposed to the drug? Correct. Everyone's exposed. Controls okay. and cases. Everyone's, okay. controls. Everyone, okay. Everyone's exposed to the drug for the same duration. So their instance density matched, which okay. is kind of nice. Okay. Yeah. And how do you define cases versus controls then? Yeah, so, so cases are individuals who deployed, who were given mefloquine, uh, who had one or more diagnoses of, in this case, post-traumatic stress disorder. After they came back? Uh, so typically the diagnoses are made once they return from deployment because the quality of administrative data captures poor right. uh, downrange. So we have data on whether they were hospitalized, whether they had multiple outpatient encounters diagnosed with PTSD, or just a single <coughs> diagnosis uh, of PTSD, which is consistent with a softer call and symptoms that might represent another disorder, for example, intoxication. So we're excited. This is a good example of what you can do with these linked 
uh, data sets and the ability to get genetic information from these serum banks is really exciting because this, uh, this serum bank contains over 50 million specimens and there are many very rare diseases uh, that manifest in the military population over time. And so you can get all sorts of strange autoimmune diseases, rare cancers, and potentially these are now amenable to pharmacogenetic study through similar methods. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks for your attention everyone, I appreciate it.